On the last episode, we learned that success in the hospitality world starts with finding the right property. Oh gosh, it's very, very important. You want to partner with people that have, the sh there's a, there needs to be alignment, they need to share your vision. And when it comes to staying afloat in the property scene, cash is king. The real estate market in Nigeria is a very cost-intensive one. Um, so you, you, you have to have a deep pocket you know, to go into it. But this is not stopping a new crop of young, successful business minds. One of the things I remember quite clearly was ShopRite telling me to show, me, show them my bank account <laughs> to oh, ensure wow. that they can sign up as, as uncle. I remember when we first started, you know, the question we got asked the most was, um, or, you know, most people say, well, I have a son that's your age. Um, <laughs> why should I give you all this money? Or what have you done, you know, before? As a young architect, even in this environment where we do have a bit of ageism, yeah. <laughs> Again, you know, um, you're so conscious and I think just that drive of being hungry and being aware that I have a statement to make, you put in an extra effort. When you're talking to a local investor who you've known for five, sometimes for some or ten years, you have to show them the money. But is this enough to make it big as a young person in the real estate world? Meet Tosin. She went from being a curious, art-loving 12-year-old to running a successful architecture firm in Lagos. This is lovely, isn't it, Tosin? So uh, we want to know a little bit more about you uh, being a well-known young architect uh, here in Lagos and we know that you are behind the design of this beautiful structure that we have here in Camp Ikare. So let's first of all, before we talk about um, Camp Ikare, let's get some background information about you. Where did this love for architecture start? Ooh, um, architecture. It's, it's been architecture for a very long time actually. Um, probably about the age of, I think, 12. Uh, my dad was building a house in Ikorodu, you know, a country home and I was the only one who was particularly interested in the floor plans when they came home. I picked up my room quickly and I, I showed a lot of interest. I used to go to site with him and I had always excelled in art in school. Um, I have an uncle who's a famous Nigerian artist, Kolade Oshino, and so everyone was like, oh, she's taking after Uncle Kolade. But uh, my parents were more inclined at that stage for me to do something more science-based. So architecture was marrying both worlds, a bit of science and a bit of art. So that was really where it came from. And what has that journey been like? I mean, obviously to get to this point where you're working on some of these uh, amazing projects. <laughs> Prior to Campicara, I had worked for a practice here locally and I'd done a lot of stuff that was standard, a lot of housing, office development, some commercial. But this, as an office, was our first project. I think also as a young architect, you're quite conscious that you have a lot to prove. Um, in an environment, architecture anywhere in the world is, is, is a profession of experience, an apprentice. So you work for someone, you understand the ropes, you understand the things to avoid before you set up on your own. I mean, in Europe, young architects are people in their 40s, and this is a given. So um, as a young architect, even in this environment where we do have a bit of ageism, <laughs> Again, you know, um, you're so conscious and I think just that drive of being hungry and being aware that I have a statement to make, you put in an extra effort. What's the vision behind this uh, project that you have here in Canada? So what, because obviously, you know, you came here and I believe there was an existing yes, uh, yes, structure that yes. here and then you looked at it and must have seen something so tell us what it is that you're trying yes to so my client actually bought this off a family who were leaving Nigeria and um, we inherited the six chalets at the front um, and we inherited an, a beach a beach house that was sitting here as well um, the original concept for the beach house was that you would go up a series of steps and then you would see the sea and then you would have to go down to the pool and you had the chalets at the front and the first time I came here, I thought, oh, this is nice, but I think we can do something different. And I think any time you inherit a project, you should add value. Yeah. You take the good that they've had and you put on top of that. Which one of your projects would you say has been the most difficult? I mean, I know we're still going to talk a little bit more about uh, your most recent project. Yeah. Most the 
uh, Maryland Moore. Yes. Which is a huge achievement, by the way. <laughs> uh, but which one would you say has been the hardest for you? Uh, I think they all have their challenges. Um, but the challenges are different. But I think... Um, I can't really answer that question. Um, I think the reality is that with any form of project, is about making sure that the people who are delivering it understand your vision and are consistent. Yeah. And it's important to constantly remind them <laughs> what you're trying to achieve. Maryland Momo, I know we're going to go there, but that's yeah. a major one. Um, yes. All over the news, it's <laughs> an amazing structure that you put up. Yeah. Tell us what that journey was like. I mean, how did this whole process take in? You know, how long did this process take in the first place? You know, um, conceptualizing the project to actually come to the point where Maryland was, uh, to be honest, if I'm going to say difficult project, that was probably the most difficult because um, it was difficult on many levels. It was difficult initially with um, trying to get the clients to see where we wanted to go with it. But I'm very happy they were so supportive. They were a great client. I'm so happy that we worked with them on it. I'm so happy that they chose us to work on it. Maryland started initially as a design review. Um, it was a JV between my clients and the landowners. They had an existing design that had been done. We were initially called in to review that design and um, it was eventually decided that we should go with a new scheme. The outside of the mall, which has also been the very interesting bit, um, we painted it black and everyone is like, why? <laughs> It was it was a it was initially a difficult sell because I mean you tell any client I want to paint your building black they're like uh no <laughs> people are gonna think we're doing something negative in here but it was to create a silhouette so it's almost like a Pandora's box you know it disappears and it's everything on the outside and then when you go and you get this nice magic. But it takes a little more than just magic or pure luck to put a building of this sort together. Tosi's clients, Obina and Laide, both under 40, are the brains behind this 5 billion naira retail center in Lagos. They managed to convince investors that their project was a bankable one. It's quite interesting what you've done here, Laide. I mean, two young guys and you've come up with this huge mall here in Maryland so I want to know how all of this started so I just want to hear the story you know where did this all start from where did this all start from um, I think uh, of course we're coming from some past experiences we've been working together for some time we came together and decided to set up Purple Capital Partners and you know we were looking for transactions to do at that point in time we did our first transaction and then this came as our next transaction which was far bigger than we actually anticipated and we wandered out to get it done and sold and, and, and dusted it. We signed the deal <laughs> and definitely did not have all of the money, if enough money. Yeah. So how did you, I mean that was going to be my next question, how did you get the funding together to do this? Because I guess that's the question on the minds of most people. The most important thing is uh, the courage to get, up, to get on with it. Uh, when we decided to go along, uh, we decided to put uh, some of our profit from our previous transactions into this as uh, seed capital to, to get the ball rolling. I think uh, one of the things I remember quite clearly was ShopRite telling me to show, me, show them my bank account <laughs> to ensure wow. that they can sign up as, as Anko. Um, and then, funny enough, all of these monies came in from local uh, partnership, local investors, local uh, banks. Um, but it shows uh, the belief in the project and the belief in, in what we have done as well. Are you in a comfortable uh, position right now, you know? Because when you think of, obviously, you know, you've taken out quite a lot of funding to get this started. Do you sleep at night? <laughs> I think maybe we should ask my neighbour, right? <laughs> um, I don't think anybody that is um, in the Nigerian marketplace today sleeps thoroughly at night um, because the market is obviously turbulent but in that turbulence is where the opportunities lie. What other challenges have you faced along the way maybe besides obviously the hurdle of getting funding to actually start the project? Uh, I think challenges started from the one securing the deal in the first place. By the way who are you and why should we sign with you? I can imagine yeah uh, especially being young. Well 
I think uh, somebody once told me nobody is young any longer, right? <laughs> but then uh, you have to consider most of these things because you know you, you have to understand the psyche of the Nigerian investment investor base and the, what they think of young people, uh, what they expect from young people, which is not always all positive. But you know, I think with the economic situation, people need to start taking us very seriously. For Lide's partner Obina, it's all about the numbers. The simple thing is that when you're talking to a local investor who you've known for five, sometimes for some or ten years, you have to show them the money. If you show them the money, money will always want to go towards, gravitate towards where value will be created. So that's simple. Show them the business model, show them how it's going to work, show them how they are going to make money, and also tell them that this is a long-term project and that the rewards will also compensate for them staying for, staying for that long term. At the same time, we are in a recession right now, so isn't this a difficult time to go into the retail business? Retail has tremendous opportunities, all right? So for instance, in retail, you don't have to, the minimum transaction value can be 500 naira. But if you're doing other sectors, minimum transaction value can be 100,000 naira, 100,000 naira. So in as much as you can feel the trend, it has the least impact because there's always money flowing in the retail. The question is, how do you position your transaction or your business to tap into that, that, that pipe? And what does the future hold for you? I mean, do you have big plans to maybe do this again? What's next? Well, we, we, we believe that there's opportunity to play, to grow the former retail space in Nigeria, right? I don't believe that being, I mean, right now, Nigeria is the 20th biggest economy in the world on a PPP basis. Now, according to PwC and World Bank, that is expected to go to number 16 in 2030, number 9 in 2050. Nine biggest economy in the world by 2050. Now, where else do you want to play? It's here. Who's going to provide the infrastructure to grow that space? Private sector investors like us. And now, for us as young entrepreneurs, we're taking the risk, we're coming in now, we're demonstrating that the next generation of entrepreneurs are here to drive that trend and keep it flowing. So imagine if we're doing this on this scale and in the next 15 years, we have this kind of development all over Lagos. It creates um, a lot of job opportunities for the local, for the local environment. It redefines the Lagos um, skyline as well, and it creates, it creates jobs. Obina, let's leave it there. I wish you an enormous amount of luck. I'm very proud of what you've done here, and I can't wait to see what you come up with next. Thank you. Our search for young successful real estate continues. We move from the retail scene to an impeccable residential offering. This four bedroom masterpiece in an affluent part of Lagos was designed by this young architect. He gave up a well paid job in the United Kingdom and relocated to Nigeria 10 years ago. That decision turned out to be the right one. How did this all start? Well, from childhood really, um, the usual cliche, like playing with Lego, was very good at fine art. Um, my dad's an architect, so it was one of those sort of rites of passage things. Uh, so in secondary school, very good at technical drawing, uh, and then in university, so it was, it was a no-brainer. Studied architecture in, in university, was, was fairly good at that. <laughs> uh, um, graduated, spent a number of years uh, working in the UK with some really, really uh, prestigious firms that helped to sort of push, you know, interest and ability. Yeah. Uh, and moved back to Nigeria in 2007 to work on uh, a landmark project in Abuja, uh, Bank of Industry headquarters. Um, and since then, it's just. Uh, it's, yeah. just, it's just gone. It's just gone on from so strength to strength. Since then, have you kind of just, you know, you, you, you've had one job and that sort of led to the next job? Yes, 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 pretty much. Um, so, most of what we do is residential. Uh, so, we've done some office uh, buildings, currently working on some civic buildings. But yeah, one job sort of normally leads, leads to another because most jobs take about two years to complete. 
anyway. So as we're working on one job on site, we're starting the design of another one, getting to tender. So usually it's like a lap. We finish one, move on to the next one, you know, sort of thing. Do you sometimes find that, um, you know, being young, has it sort of held you back in any way? Do people meet you and say, oh, this is a very young architect and bringing on to... Uh... Um, not really, not really. I mean... We're in a patriarchal society and, you know, where you're about, so you sort of, there's the issue with elders, parents and whatever else. Um, it, it's funny because I find that I'm stuck between sort of two generations. Um, so uh, clients are usually quite older because, you know, they, they have more access to means uh, and the money to deliver uh, some of these projects. And then also on, on, on the other side, you know, we're not that much older than uh, students and other architects who are just sort of coming out of university who we have to work with so you know it's it's a, it's a fine balance and I mean with anything else if you know the fact that you're sort of younger probably means that you have to explain yourself a bit more you know because you have to convince people to hand over a lot of money um, to you know to, to 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 do something because I remember when we first started you know the question we got asked the most was um, or you know most people say well I have a son that's your age um, why should I give you all this money or what have you done you know before it certainly got easier now that we've completed some buildings, you know, because now we can refer, you know, to, to buildings that we've done. And then a, a lot of our clients are very, very helpful in sort of recommending us and giving us good, you know, good positive feedback or recommendations. Let's talk about so, your work, because yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite obvious that your buildings are not the norm. Typical, They're yes. Quite modern <laughs> and a lot more sophisticated, I must say, than what we try, we try. Here. Uh, you know, just, what is it that inspires you? Um, very simply, just by uh, the the desire to be to be different, to be better. Now I know you're going to be taking us around uh, this building, but before that, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about it. Um, okay, so we call this uh, we name this Scissor House. We, we sort of name all our buildings because we we feel like it personalizes it as well. And most buildings, most of our buildings have a story. Uh, a lot of what we do is concept driven, so we, you know, we find inspiration from, from all sorts of places, from nature, from everyday objects, and for whatever else. Um, this one we called it Scissor House because, you know, it sort of looks like the front end of the scissor if you're sort of looking at it head on because of the inverted angles of the corners uh, of the building. But what it is, very simply, is it's just our own take on the townhouse, on the three-storey, you know, townhouse. And there are lots of townhouses, but we, we thought, you know, why don't we have a little fun, you know, with this one? Why don't we look at it differently um, and, and see how we can try and make this, you know, stand out. Pretty much everything here, except maybe the tiles, were made and bought in Nigeria. You know, the windows, you know, the door, um, the hinges, the, 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 the Tyrolean finish as well. And I would like to walk through the building Let's go, now let's go, let's go. Let's go. So you come in through the front door. Door is solid wood, solid mahogany, made in Nigeria. Absolutely, absolutely. Self closes. Um, and I mean, this is the house pretty much. Yeah, you come in and you meet the staircase. Uh, crafted, made in Nigeria as well. The steelwork, the wood, the glass, absolutely. Uh, we've got a skylight at the top that lets light right through uh, over the entrance. And then, so the landings act as bridges between the two sides of the house. So, like I said, quite small house. You've got the den. Yeah, I know it does because of the way we molded it. I know that you still have a lot of the house to show us, yes. so perhaps we should do that. You yes. talked about a terrace on top. Yes, yes, yes. I would like yes. to see that. Um, so it's okay. this way clearly, this right? This way clearly, so you've got the man cave. Okay. And our property tour doesn't end there. Just a few minutes down the road is this unique structure, also designed by another young architect. 
Architecture has sort of always been a passion since I was very young. Uh, since I was very young, uh, and, in, and the arts in total have been sort of something that's always driven me. Whether it was when I was younger, I was really passionate about film. I was really passionate just about literature, and I was really passionate about fine art. Uh, and for me, sort of architecture was like the culmination of all my interests. It's no surprise that this artistic flair drove him into the property design space. Let's start with this beautiful building. Uh, it's certainly a very interesting building. I guess since we're standing right here, a good place to start would be for you to tell me the vision behind this piece of art. I might as well call it art. Uh, I've never seen anything like it here in Lagos. Uh, yeah, the building, what's, what's so great about this building is that it came, it came through a long, uh, working process. It was really trying to tell a story, partly about the history of the site and also about the history of the area and how much it's changed. Uh, it was an existing commercial building from the early 70s that stood here previously and it was one of the few commercial buildings within this quite residential enclave. Uh, and what, what we try to do is obviously we're retaining it for commercial purposes but I think what our vision was was to look back and to try and re-engage the building in what this area used to be like. And used to be like a really beautifully tree-lined street. So I think one of the important things for us was to see if we could create an experience for the users that sort of took them back in time slightly and also had a really strong sense of sustainability, uh, really promoting uh, a new way of thinking about architecture, not just in terms of the sculptural elements, but also in terms of the environment. It's very obvious that you're not just an architect, you also have a love for art and you've created this fusion between art and architecture. So I wanted to perhaps tap into your brain and get a sense of your vision or what is it about art and architecture that you think fits so perfectly together? Um, I think for the starting point for us is always like we see architecture as the art of manipulating space. It's about creating experiences. Uh, and I think central to, I, I think the reason art is so important for us as a firm and me as an individual is that it gives us um, an opportunity to find distinctive reference points. Uh, what I mean by that, we do a lot of collaborations in, in our work. We try and work with artists on specific themes within buildings or we use art as a conceptual idea that starts off what the project may end up being and that can be anything from a, a painting to a film or to a sketch from an artist and I think that allows us to hone in uh, our own ideas a little bit better. And as if this gorgeous building isn't enough you also have uh, some other really interesting uh, buildings uh, that you've put up but there's one that caught my eye on the mainland uh, so let's talk about some of these alternative buildings of yours. Um, as you say, we've done some really great buildings. Uh, I mean, it was great to be a part of the Making Africa exhibition, which was at the Guggenheim Museum. And one of the projects that we did, uh, the sanctuary was within that. Uh, it was really another exciting project we did, which was uh, with the University of Lagos and GT Bank. Uh, University of Lagos alumni and GT Bank. And what was really exciting about that was about taking a corporate organization and an institution and also the student body and finding a way to, to merge these three elements together. It's clear that these young property entrepreneurs have a lot more in common than we thought. A love for the arts, an eye for detail, and the ability to walk their talk and play the right cards in the capital intensive property game. On the next episode, we take you on a tour of Africa's most luxurious residential homes. We explore some of the continent's property masterpieces and speak to the faces behind the buildings. <laughs> <laughs>